Kia ora and welcome to Share Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies with Business Desk. Sharesies is a wealth development platform whose purpose is to create financial empowerment. My name is Dan Brunskill, I'm a reporter at Business Desk, and we have a special offer for Sharesies investors. If you use the promo code SHAREDLUNCH100, you'll get $100 off an annual subscription to Business Desk, which is usually $249, including GST, like uh, we almost had on KiwiSaver earlier this week. The offer only applies to new business desk subscribers and can only be used once per subscriber and can't be used with any other discounts. Okay, before we get started, here is some important information. Investing involves risk. You might lose the money you start with. We recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before deciding to invest. Everything you're about to see and hear is current at the time of recording. Investing involves... Also, as a quick reminder, if you have any questions for our guests today, and I suspect you will, you can submit them through the Ask a Question button down below. Um, don't leave your questions in the discussion area, as we're likely to miss them. Um, get in with your questions early. We, we, can, we can go to questions quickly if, um, if, if there are lots. And don't forget to vote on your favorite questions as well, because we'll probably triage it like that a little bit. Uh, please be kind and respectful towards our guest and your fellow viewers. Otherwise, we will remove you from the webinar. Uh, today we're going to discuss discuss the uh, the very bouncy time in the property market, if you if you can call it that. What what do rising interest rates mean for the sector? The pluses and minuses for investing in shares versus property, uh, and all this and more. We'll be um, going over everything housing related, and to do so, we've brought in um, the big names, uh, independent economist Tony Alexander. Hello, Tony. How's it going, Dan? Ah, very well, very well. And how are you today? Yeah, fine, thanks. Yeah, I was in Nelson last night talking to a bunch of people down there at a, at a function focused on the economy um, in the housing market. And I've got a similar thing up at uh, Power Param, uh, further up the Kapiti Coast um, tonight. So yeah, yeah, uh, fairly timely, a lot of interest in property currently. It, it feels like everyone is talking about it. What is houses going to do next? What is interest rates going to do next? Should I buy? Should I not buy? If I sell now, how much will I lose? It, it, is this a question you find people are talking to you a lot about saying, Tony, what's happening? Not so much. I mean, most people aren't looking at property, I think, from that trading point of view of, you know, should I uh, sell now and look to buy later? I mean, certainly housing is an asset and it's something which people use to help you know fund their retirement but fundamentally um it's it provides a flow of service people want to get a house so they can raise a family uh live in security near their work recreation um, or whatever and i find for most people while yeah it's an investment it really is a lifetime um thing for, for like i say raising a family a nice secure place so i don't tend to get many questions related to short-term transactions no okay that's a good. It's a good reminder. Is a, a lot more than an investment, even though we might talk about it a little bit like that um, today. Okay, so after the the sort of post COVID housing price boom, it kind of looks like the housing market prices, at least, is is in retreat. But before we kind of dive into that, w would you be able to give us a, a, a thirty second catch up on the housing market over the past decade? What happened? How did we get to where we are now? Yep, house prices started rising strongly in Auckland from 2012 with a lot of talk about uh, shortages spread to the rest of the country by about 2015. Prices rose strongly everywhere. They stopped rising in Auckland for three years from 2016, but the rest of the country barreled along. In 2019, the Reserve Bank cut interest rates three quarters of a percent to record lows. All the country started accelerating again. COVID hit. Everything stopped for two or three months and prices on average fell 3%. But with the removal of LVRs and uh, also the interest rates at record lows, we couldn't spend our usual $10 billion uh, traveling overseas. Uh, we basically jumped into the housing market and buying spas and home renovations, uh, electric scooters, all these sort of things. FOMO took off. It was at its highest levels from August 2020 through to February 2021. 20, uh, House prices rose at a, at a rate each month of about 2.7% each month. Uh, and then we saw the Reserve Bank restore LVRs in March of 2021, strengthen them for investors in May. We saw the tax changes for the investors uh, effective from March 27 last year. The market slowed for three months. House prices only rose about 0.7% in each of those three months. And then we get into the, to the really interesting bit between last year, July and November, house prices rose by a surprising 11% 
despite interest rates rising, despite net migration outflows, despite the tax cha changes, um, despite the uh, uh, LVRs, the triple CFA, etc. And so when we got to late last year, the market was well overpriced. It was irrational exuberance, uh, uh, like a crypto thing. And uh, with the changes for the triple CFA in December and extra loan to value ratio tightening in November, those were the two branches that broke the camel's back. And on average, we've seen prices fall 10.8% for the country as a whole uh, from the peak in November. Auckland about 15% or 16, sorry. Wellington about 15%, Canterbury uh, about 4%. And so now the position we're at is uh, prices are, are, like I say, down almost 11%. Sales are 37% weaker than a year earlier. It's taken on average about 14 days longer to sell a dwelling than a year ago. And the number of properties listed for sale is 107% higher than a year earlier. So we're in the weak phase of the house price cycle at the moment. Tony, it's fascinating to hear you compare house prices to 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 the crypto market i think in in the year ended november house prices were up sort of 30% you, you consider that to be a sort of a, a maybe smaller in scale but a similar speculative bubble to what we saw in in cryptocurrencies yeah yeah definitely it's the same sort of human emotions people bought crypto not because they necessarily needed it for anything maybe apart from paying for some malware removal or or, or buying some weapons up online but because of a belief that other people would look to buy it and there seemed to be some easy money to be made so that is slightly different maybe from housing where i don't think it was so much of a motivation of i'm, I'm gonna make some easy money on housing i think more for housing it was the thing of i'm going to miss out i i'm going to need a house at some stage or i was going to buy an investment property at some stage the way things are going if i wait too long i might not be able to afford to and so that's why in my monthly survey of real estate agents, I asked them explicitly, are you seeing FOMO? Are you seeing fear of missing out on the part of buyers? And as I say, that was at really high levels between, uh, uh, I think it was, I said about July or so of 2020 and February of 2021. So a slightly different thing, but definitely I, I guess I threw that in because what I wanted to emphasize was that that extra soaring of prices in the second half of 2021 really wasn't related to economic fundamentals, household income fundamentals. It was sort of an extra spurt upward and the bulk of the fall in prices we're seeing at the moment is simply a correction back from that unusual period. That's what that's about. Yeah. So that's, that's sort of my next question is, prices are still up on a year ago, despite the pretty sharp fall. How much further are we imagining house prices to go? Yeah, best guess for most of us is 5%. You'll find that a lot of the time when us economists are asked to guess about something, uh, maybe five or so. Um, it's it's small, but it, and it's also not a large number. And frankly, for most of us, we've been thinking once we could see the prices were really rocketing off, maybe they're going to go down about 15%. And so they've done about 11, so maybe another four or 5%. We've also had the Reserve Bank uh, three months ago saying that uh, once house prices have fallen 15, 1.5%, they will no longer consider them to be unsustainable from a financial system stability point of view. Nothing to do with affordability, but so most of us are probably thinking there is still further downside in house prices. I, I'm definitely of that uh, view. And I think we've reached the stage in the cycle where many of the vendors who have been holding out uh, they've had offers come in for their properties. They haven't sold. They keep hoping they're going to get a price similar to what they could have got last year. They're giving up. They're capitulating to the market. And they're going to now accept you know, what the buyers are offering. I think in the short term, you get prices down a little bit further. But come the end of this year, I think there's a very good chance they could have bottomed out and then some small rises. Okay, let me say, repeat, small rises over 2023. Interesting. So, so when the housing market prices start going back up, we're not going to see more of these 30% increases, um, house prices doubling every few years. We're going to see slower increases. I would expect slower increases. Something I've been saying for a number of years is that eventually the average increase in house prices in New Zealand will no longer be the 7% that we've seen on average since 1992. Auckland's been about 8%. 
um, or so. I think Queenstown is about you know nine nine percent. We're not going to see that going forward. We obviously had these really special, unusual circumstances of the pandemic. So we've got to be be careful about talking about sort of what's happening in the short term. Things are still a bit all over the place. But the number I've been using for some time is that I would expect over the long term now for New Zealand house prices, they'll go up around about 5% per annum. And that's basically a result of uh, inflation at around about 2% per annum. And on average, wages grow 2% more than uh, inflation. Uh, that's what's happened in the past two decades. That gives you about 4%. And then just increasing construction costs and uh, uh, land availability. Now, I, I, I find it relatively easy to see average house prices are rising about 5%. Of course, the thing about property is it's very location specific, not just the region, but the city, the suburb, nearness to uh, a new bus station or train station or something. There are still a lot of variables in there. So. Us economists will throw out these average numbers like that, knowing that actually on the ground, uh, the increases long term could be all over the place. Interesting. So what does that mean for um, sort of a, a younger generation, say people in their 20s who are, who are looking to build wealth? Is a house still a way to go? I mean, I remember my parents basically taught me two financial lessons when I was a kid. One was like, don't use a credit card, don't get in debt to buy a house. And that was it. That was that was the extent of the financial education. Is that still the way to go? Can we still build wealth by buying houses and waiting for them to increase in value? I never bought a property on the basis of building building wealth. I think that's where people have got slightly astray here. Certainly the message from New Zealand governments for three decades has been you need to save money, build wealth for your retirement because maybe national superannuation, the pension won't be paid. Well, I never really believed that, but when those messages started coming out, um, people were receptive to them, but it was right after the share market crash of 1987 when share prices fell about 60%. So there was sort of a natural gravitation not towards shares as an asset back then, three and a half decades ago, um, but towards housing and obviously the whole thing um, gained momentum. And my, my recommendation for people is to keep focused on housing more in terms of you want to get your first house, you can start raising your family, yeah, you'll build wealth on that on average over time and you plan towards when you maybe need a bigger house. Uh, you're going you know, with higher incomes, uh, uh, family circumstances are changing, and maybe then there's a retirement property or something along the way. I, I advise people focus on that first of all, of what is best for your family as you and your partner are growing it over the next you know, 10, 20, uh, 30 years. And in terms of growing wealth, uh, focus maybe first of all on KiwiSaver, having some money put aside there. I think that's a great way to get yourself set up for uh, retirement. And then if your circumstances allow along the way, maybe when you're into your 30s or so, maybe then start thinking about a potentially an investment property off the side. I can't help but think that too many young people, because they have such great knowledge of investment alternatives and vehicles like shares for you know gaining exposure to you know, shares is possibly just not quite enough focus on the life services the house provides and maybe a wee bit too much on capital gain and not missing out from that point of view. That, that's just the broad comment I'd make there. I think that's a very valuable perspective. It, it feels almost to me like um, people have been encouraged in New Zealand to think about housing as um, both simultaneously an extremely safe investment and as a as sort of a high growth, high return investment. Um, and those two things are are usually contradictory. And then when you add a whole nother set of aspects, like it has to fit into your personal life and um, mm -hmm. sort of the rent saving aspect, it's kind of, we're trying to get housing to do absolutely everything um, when it probably should only be one or two of those things. Yeah, yeah. Focus on what's most important to you. And, and that is, I guess, what I've really been emphasizing the past few week, uh, months and the past few weeks in particular. This essentially has been my, my, my key message. You've got to ask yourself, if you are a first home buyer, what is most important to you? Is it hanging back from buying because you want to get the last 5% of the house price cycle? Is, is that the game you're playing? Or is the most important thing taking advantage of vendors capitulating on prices, the stock of listings double what it was a year ago in some parts of the country, it's up 180% from a year ago, taking advantage of that to secure a property you can then raise your family in over the next, like I say, one, two, three decades. It seems to me that second thing is more important. And just be aware, 
there's not a single one of us on the planet can accurately pick when and at what level the bottom of a price cycle will be for housing, for shares, for, for crypto, commercial property, or the top as well. But there's enough people out there in New Zealand thinking that way, that when the market in New Zealand is close to turning, a lot of the people who've been thinking, I'm intelligent, I can pick the bottom, they're going to go, I think we're at it, boom they could step in relatively quickly. And that stepping back into the market relatively quickly, it's gonna be different from past housing cycles when prices have been going, because in the past, falling house prices have been associated with a lot of weakness in our economy and the unemployment rate rising strongly, such as 3% from 3.5% to 6.5% from uh, 2007, uh, 8 into 2009. This time around, we've got an unemployment rate of 3.3%. It'll go up a bit job security is strong. The buyers have not deserted the market like they've done in previous cycles. They're there, they're just in the shadows. And I think they're going to step forward. And that's where it gets interesting. You've heard me say the number of listings is 107% higher than a year earlier. And so you might be thinking, oh, there's properties for sale everywhere. Yeah, well, just a bit of perspective, that number of listings, about 28,000, is still around 21% below the average since 2007, and it's about 38% below the number of 10 years earlier. And my feeling is that when people think the bottom's there, they jump in. Over 2023, the stock of listings will go back down again, and that's one reason I'll, I think I've thrown in there. I see prices maybe rising 5% or so next year, because the key driver, in my opinion, of what happened in the second half of last year, uh, when the prices rose despite all those negative things, the stock of property available for sale fell to a record low around August or September last year of below 14,000. And FOMO went back up again because people thought, oh my goodness, there's hardly anything for sale, I'd better act now. That will come back again, not for six months or so, but it will come back again in bits and pieces over 2023. It's interesting you say that. You, you had a survey, I think your survey's out this morning, um, and, and it showed a, a sort of a, a notable, I think you described as a notable increase in um, plans to invest in residential property versus previous months. Is that the sort of thing you're talking about? And, 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 and what do you think is driving that? Why are people feeling more confident to jump in now or in the next 12 months than they have been in the previous? Yeah, I, I have two sort of measures I can derive relevant to investors and relevant to first home buyers. For the investors in the survey I do each month, which shares these of portfolio investors generally, I've found a, an increase in the net proportion thinking about buying property. I think it now sits at about 29% from 24% a few months ago. It's an increase of that, that magnitude. Now, just be a bit careful. You'd look at that and you go, oh, there's a lot of investors back in the market. Uh, but you look at my other surveys, the likes of one I'll release next week of real estate uh, agents, for instance. I've been doing this one for about two and a half years. It still shows a net 30, 35% of real estate agents saying they're seeing fewer investors. The investors aren't really stepping back into the housing market. It's uh, back in. They're stepping away at a slowing pace, however. They are showing a bit of interest, but they are a bit further back in the shadows than the first home buyers. And that is really what's changing at the moment. So from that survey I do with REINZ, um, next week when I release the results of, again, along with the REINZ people, it's gonna show about a net 6% of real estate agents saying they are seeing more first home buyers in the market. And that's gonna be the first positive result since about August uh, or so of last year. And I also each month survey uh, mortgage uh, advisors uh, with the company mortgages.co.nz and the mortgage advisors, the brokers, they also had about a net 8% uh, two to three weeks ago saying they're now seeing more first home buyers back in the market. Earlier this year, it was like a net 70% saying they're seeing fewer first home buyers. And that latest result in the positive territory for more first home buyers, um, that's the strongest since February of 2021, before things really started tightening up. So it doesn't mean we're back to February 21 or anything like that. But the first home buyers, they actually are now the first ones who are stepping forward into the market. 
I think some of the investors will follow, but they're going to wait and see what the opinion polls do, because if the opinion polls politics um, show National uh, with a good chance of winning next year, with National having said when re-elected, whenever, they will uh, restore interest expense deductibility and take the bright line test back to two years. Investors then will step back in the market. And people should realise that when the taxes were changed, the regime March 27 last year, as buyers, the investors stood back. I can see it in all of my surveys. But there is zero evidence of any wave of investor selling as a result of the tax changes, rising interest rates, anything like that. That is a key element which is sort of missing and sort of limiting some of the weakness. Oh, and in terms, Dan, I think you might have asked it, why might people be showing some more interest in the market um, at the moment? Uh, partly it's because credit is being made more readily available by the, the banks. Things have improved from the, the depths of the credit crunch over sort of February, March was the worst of it. Things have definitely um, improved. And the fixed mortgage rates, the banks are sort of discounting uh, things there and they've actually decreased 0.2% to 0.4% from where they were in June. I don't think they're going to go down any further in the very near future, but I think that they've already peaked out there two and a half months ago. So you think mortgage mortgage rates have peaked and, and, and are probably going to hold roughly where they are from here? That would be your guess? Yeah, I, I think so. I track the margins which banks are making on average, where they're lending, where they borrow. You see, if they lend to somebody out there, you and I, at a fixed rate for two years, on pretty much the same day in the wholesale markets, the bank will borrow from wholesale investors at a fixed rate for two years, and they lock in the margin on the day. Those margins are below average at the moment. So there's not much scope, especially for the one to two year terms, for the banks to cut more in the future. But watch out for middle of October. In the middle of October, we'll get the inflation number out for the year to September. And pretty much all of us are expecting the inflation rate will go down in New Zealand uh, from 7.3% to something less. And in the second half of October, we're going to have increased discussion about interest rates going down in New Zealand. I still don't think they'll go down much further for a while, but the discussion is going to start making some of these people in the shadows start stepping forward a bit more. Not yet, okay? I still see prices falling, okay. but these are the things that are starting to change out there for the next few months. Tony, what happens if that inflation rate comes out in October and it's higher than we expected? Yeah, shouldn't rule that out because we have had these big surprises. I came back to New Zealand in 1987, and I think about two or three weeks after I, I landed back again, we had the inflation number for the year to the middle of 87 come out, and I think it was about 1% higher than expected. And everything went sort of ballistic in the money markets and the interest rates uh, shot up, the Reserve Bank tightening monetary policy again, etc. Um, we don't expect it, but we didn't back then either. Um, and we didn't expect much lower than expected numbers uh, following the global financial crisis. And at some stage, people are going to be thinking, let's say a year or two from now, oh, are we back into the low inflation environment, which was such a problem for central banks from 2009 through to, well, uh, uh, the start of 2020? You know, don't know. Um, but yeah, Dan, we shouldn't rule out that there is a surprise in the number there. Yeah, I, I've been around this week sort of talking to a few economists about what they expect to happen. And, and, and they all say the same thing as you, that that uh, they expect interest rates to sort of hold where they are and then ease over the next year or so. But there's a there's this serious, incredible risk that, that could go the other way. So that's sort of a, a tricky thing to think about. And as you say, um, we shouldn't be timing the housing market like like, like trading a, a commodity. Yeah. But um, yeah. it's an interesting, uh, in interesting situation. Yeah. So, so you've lived through a period of high inflation before, of course, haven't you, Tony? How does, how does this one feel compared to previous ones? Oh, look, my apologies to all of the young people out there uh, watching this, but um, there's a whole generation of us going 7.3% inflation. I know you think it's serious, but by crikey, you should have lived through the 70s and the 1980s when we had a quadrupling of oil prices in 73, 74. They doubled again with the Iranian revolution late in the decade. New Zealand lost the easy access to Europe and the UK when the UK went to the common market in, in uh, January 1973. We had massive net migration outflows of 156,000 people from 1975 through to 82, these sort of things. Things were not that flash. Oh, you needed a prescription to buy margarine, I think, back in the day, and it took six weeks to get your telephone connected. So um, I, I have a, a certain perspective on this, uh, which says to me 7.3% 
I could certainly understand it's a shock to the average person out there because it's the highest inflation rate since about 1990 when inflation was on its way down from averaging, if I recall rightly, about 11 percent in the 10 years uh, uh, leading in, into to then. Um, but of course, it does mean that people's budgets are crimped. And as people are having to uh, allocate more spending for the groceries, we are cutting back in other areas on buying of the furniture, um, the appliances, electrical goods, you know, all these sort of things. And what's interesting, we are involuntarily allocating more money on groceries, but we're voluntarily allocating more money on overseas travel. We are going to engage in the revenge travel, which people in the Northern Hemisphere have been doing for the past uh, uh, few months. That means extra weakness for a lot of New Zealand retailers, but it does mean I think it's reasonable for the tourism, the hospitality, the accommodation sector in New Zealand to expect a reasonably good summer if they can get the staff. And just for your guide, Australia opened up earlier than New Zealand and their foreign visitor numbers are running at about 40 to 50 percent of what they were in 2019. So we're not talking about a return to pre-COVID tourism still for a while yet. Long way to go. Okay, Tony, I reckon we better jump into listener questions because we have so many of them. Um, cool. So I'll just start firing those to you. Here's one from Adrian. Uh, he asks, do you have any thoughts or insights into why Wellington house prices have fallen so much faster than the rest of the country, despite having a higher median income and probably more constrained land supply? Yeah, we're talking Wellington City here by and large. Wellington region as a whole is sort of overvalued. It's above its trend with the rest of the country. You're looking at relatively low population growth in Wellington City versus double the population growth in the Wire Wrapper going up the Kapiti Coast into the Horror Whenua for Manawatu, Whanganui, etc. Um, and I think part of it for Wellington comes down to a pretty poor image. The water pipes are breaking. It's getting harder and harder to run a business and get out to the uh, airport. Uh, terrible stories on student accommodation. And I think for a lot of people, there's the easy alternative of remaining on the career ladder and getting a far cheaper property to live in, in Christchurch, in Rolleston. I mean, you've had the Southern Motorway developed, completed down there, the Northern Corridor out of uh, uh, Christchurch, bypassing in you know, a main north road, etc. I think there's some internal migration in many parts of New Zealand, and I suspect Wellington in particular, down to Christchurch. You can still be on the corporate ladder, fully immersed in the cultural scene, uh, technology uh, scene, and get yourself far cheaper accommodation um, than would have been the case uh, elsewhere. It does surprise me a bit, that weakness in Wellington. I did not expect it, uh, given you know, that prices didn't shoot up as much as elsewhere. And that's sort of, I guess, what I'm defaulting to at the moment. I think there are quite a few image problems for the uh, capital city at the, just currently. Uh I think that's a valid take. I, I even know, um, you know, policy advisors, people who work for government who have bought in Christchurch and they just kind of split their time between the two cities, taking advantage of some flexible working, even though their, their job is very Wellington centric. Yeah. Um, here's a question that that uh, that relates to um, what you just said. Uh, Max asks, "It's always an interesting question. What is something you've changed your mind about in the past twelve months?" Oh, what have I changed my mind you. about in the past twelve months? Spending all my time working on my ten acres. Uh, because uh, I've been here for about uh, 29 years and uh, I've watched the weather changes over time. I'm having to spend some money for a new culvert in the driveway because the rainfall is changing um, here. I'm going to be spending about a quarter of my time going forward now um, in Australia on the Gold Coast. Um, bought an apartment that there in Broad Beach, looks out over some fields, uh, playing fields that will never get built out, etc. And so my decision is I'm going to spend at least 25% of my year um, across there. I've started to feel New Zealand is a bit more oppressive than I became accustomed to after living here up to 84 and coming back in 87. So that maybe has been the more significant lifestyle change related change in my mind over the past 12 months. My view of New Zealand has degraded, I'm sorry, a little bit over the past 12 months. And for me, it manifests itself as I'm going to spend quite a bit of time with those those brash, slightly racist uh, Aussies across on the, on the Gold Coast. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Uh, so that, that's that's a that's a deeper answer than I expected. So you're becoming one of those who will um, be spending some time over in Australia, the uh, the the brain drain, so to speak. But only twenty five percent of your brain. Yeah, only twenty five percent of the time. I mean, I came back to New Zealand in eighty seven, not for family, not for friends, not for the money, 
but for the land, basically. I just wanted my own patch of land somewhere that I could work, um, and it took six years, but I eventually got it. Um, now, I've I sort of buggered up my right leg. I've got a full rupture of the rectus uh, femoris there, and so it, it just quietens you down a bit on all the hillsides around about my place. So I'm thinking, okay, I'll, I'll revert a bit more to riding push bike over on the Gold Coast in the heat or or, or, or going along the beach, something, something like that. So that's partly what it's related to. Well, that sounds lovely. Um, Gordon asks, is the supply side of housing, land availability, intensification, consents, and ultimately new builds, looking in better shape now than a few years ago? Do we have more housing supply coming online? Yeah, yep. we, we have more housing supply coming online and especially more of the lower priced properties. There's very good research done by a woman, Kay Saville Smith, and she's showed that up to the mid 1990s, about 25% of houses being built in New Zealand were in the lower 25% of the, the, the entire price range entry level houses. But from the middle of the 1990s, only about 5% of the houses we were building in this country were at the first home buyer level. That is now changing with the increased intensification, the townhouses in particular getting built um, around the country. So that sort of lack of that particular supply um, is being addressed. There's still a deficiency. Um, the big deficiency is for social housing through the OECD on average eight. So 8% 8 of housing stock in the OECD is social housing. New Zealand is three or 4% if you're lucky. That shortage is there. It needs badly addressing with further effort by Kainga Ora, uh, councils, et cetera. Um, and so, you know, they're still gonna be out there building uh, for a while. Um, the number of consents to be issued for new houses to be built is now going to be trending down. The rise to 51,000 in the past year, a lot of inexperienced, undercapitalized, over-optimistic people got dragged into the sector. The houses they've got consented won't be built. They don't have the finance any longer. But the actual level of house construction in New Zealand, I still think it's gonna remain quite strong. It'll ease off a bit in the next two to three years, but there's a lot of backlog of construction to be done. I do think there'll be some falling over, not just of developers, but also of some of the builders as well. And you are looking at 40 to 50% declines in some of that development land people paid too much for last year. That's where the big weakness is in the residential property market um, at the moment. So there's just some, some thought, basically more supply coming forward. It's a good thing, but remember the construction costs, they're only going one way. Yeah. I, th I think Kiwi Bank estimated that, that the housing shortage is, is maybe about 23,000 homes at the moment, which sort of a year ago it was perhaps 50 or 60,000, um, and we've sort of consented enough to sort of reach oversupply level. But do, do you think there's much risk of oversupply, or, or, or once we get close to the right amount, people will just stop, stop building even things that are consented? Uh, if, if the buyers aren't there, the building is not going to occur eventually, but it's the discussion about oversupply or a shortage that is important, not necessarily the fundamentals. You see, if people think there's going to be a shortage of toilet paper, they will buy toilet paper, that, even if there's, there's no reality to the situation. And if we now, this is something I said would come along at this time of 2022, I've been talking about this for over 12 months ago, I said, at some stage, we will choose to wallow in concerns about the brain drain, net migration loss, and at the same time, who's going to buy all these townhouses? We're going to wallow in the negative price implications of those two things. We are there now. That's why the vendors are capitulating and looking to meet the market. You've got all these things coming together. And for someone like me who's been around long enough and seen the cycles, when you see that sort of thing happening, you say, as I'm writing now, we're in the end game with this fall in prices. They're still gonna fall further, but we're approaching the bottom in the next few months because this wallowing and talk of oversupply is part of that phenomenon. But you know, just remember anybody who's really made any house price forecasts on the basis of a fundamental analysis of demand growth versus supply growth, uh, they haven't really generated uh, very accurate predictions over the past three to four uh, uh, decades. Uh, the same for those who have compared yields on investing in residential property versus um, uh, managed funds, et cetera. That analysis doesn't give you insight into where prices are gonna go. I think what you've taught me today, Tony, is that whether you're buying toilet paper, crypto, or a house, it's, uh, it's very human emotion driven.
it's it's the emotion that becomes dominant in these sort of situations and that's what you learn from experience like m maybe it's what you learn I've, I've never been in the military but maybe it's what you learn when you're in a firefight you learn what your emotions are going to be and by understanding how that part of you wants to react you can control it and see things more clearly and make the right decisions and you, you only get this insight through personal experience basically over time and I've been around watching New Zealand housing cycles since you know, the 1970s when you know, unfortunately my father was a builder and got weeded out unfortunately with the downturn in the second part of the 1970s and and I've experiencing experienced the FOMO when I bought my first house in September 1987 100% gripped by FOMO no deposit just sort of made it up um, and it was one month before the share market crash. It was half an acre of land with an old house in Blackberry, and I would definitely do it again. Um, but I, I fully understand the role of FOMO. Experience allows you to understand how people will feel at certain points in the cycle, what they are going to do, and therefore what maybe you should do as well to you know, benefit from it or avoid making mistakes. That's great. Hey, another question here from Gregory, who, who asks, since the housing market is going south, prices are going down. Why is it that the price of building a new home is is basically skyrocketing? It's never been so expensive. Oh, yeah. Well, the, the like, like I say, there's an element of house prices, the existing ones going down. They just went up too high, especially uh, uh, last year. And people have just pulled back. Um, they can't get the credit as they could have previously. The financing cost is, is higher. Population growth in New Zealand was only 0.2% in the past year, 0.4% the year before that. It was 2% per annum for five years or six years from 2015 through to 2019. So there definitely are some fundamentals in there. The construction costs going up, well, new insulation requirements all the time. Um, new earthquake standards, uh, new and stronger inspections, health and safety uh, uh, measures, uh, scaffolding rules, uh, materials costs going up with supply chain difficulties, which are going to continue for a while. China is still following a, an eradication strategy for COVID-19. Supply chains are still going to remain interrupted the rest of this year and through a lot of 2023. Um, for that reason. And so, yeah, the costs, there's a different dynamic driving them than the housing market generally going through its, uh, its, its cycles. History shows that when construction costs go up, they don't tend to go back into the negative again. Unfortunately, they tend to get locked into the system. And with construction costs going up so much in the past year, it's like existing house prices are coming down, construction costs going up, they're going to meet at some point and that will provide a support for house prices at some point in 2023. Yeah, and that will probably be the point where, where supply, the, the rate of supply slows down. Yeah, yeah, it may be. Like I say, the biggest supply consideration, I think, is more going to be the listings. Uh, remember, house prices skyrocketed in the second half of last year. Despite the number of consents rising last year from 40,000 to 50,000, but house prices went up. So consent, new supply, that is not a determinant of where house prices are going to go. But the listings, they fell to a record low below 14,000 in August last year. That's a key influence on price movements in the short term. Interesting, interesting. Okay, here's a question, not, a, not for buyers, but for us renters. What are your thoughts on rent increases over the near term? They've, they've suggested, the ask has suggested around five years, considering how much gross yields have dropped on rental properties because the prices are so high. What are the key drivers for rental increases? Um, will people be putting them through or do there need to be income increases for them to put through population growth, mortgage rates? What, 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 what drives rent prices and where are they going to go over the next couple of years? Yeah, rents are not driven by the same dynamics at all as the house prices, the house price cycle, the, these sort of things. They are very much driven by what the market will bear um, in New Zealand. There is no shortage because there are so many average Kiwis, you know, with the you know, houses as investments, that they're probably closer to understanding the lifestyles and the, the, the desires, et cetera, of their tenants than you know, might be the, the case in, in other countries. Um, and I've always found for many landlords, no great willingness to push rents through to as much as they can. They simply want to have a good long-term tenant um, that will look after the property and then they will just naturally accrue some capital gain over the long term. 65% plus of the respondents in the monthly survey I do with Crocker's property management of property investors in particular, they say they're either going to hold their house at least 10 years, the investment, or they never plan to sell it. 
So yeah, the, the rents don't change in response to the house price cycle as previously. We've got rents uh, slowing down at the moment, the rental growth. A lot of people have had a catch up after the rental freeze. What was that last year or a bit, bit before then? Um, they've got their rent increases through. And now we have extra rental properties being put on the market because some people are looking to sell. They don't want to be a weak seller in a buyer's market. And so they've taken the property off the market and they'll put it into the rental stock um, instead. So there's a decent amount of that out there. And I think the rental increases, the pace will slow down for the next 12 to 15 months. And in some parts of the country, there's definitely rental reductions, which are underway in Auckland and Wellington in particular. I, I'm sorry, I don't have a feel for Christchurch, Hamilton, Tauranga, um, et cetera. But rental growth, once we get through this still uncertain COVID-related period, um, I would expect something more closely related to growth in household incomes of about 4% per annum um, or something like that. But I, I still think we're looking at a slowdown for the next 12, 15, 18 months in rental increases. That's um, that's reassuring to hear for those of us who are, who are shelling out more than a third of our income to, um, to rent a house. Sure. Um, what, what other questions do we have here that we have not already asked? Uh, are there any major legal changes or, or law changes coming to the housing market that we should look out for that might impact prices? And uh, There are the insulation requirements strengthening from, sorry, I think it's May next year, going to boost construction cost. I think it's about 4% or so. I'm sorry, I can't quite remember that amount. Um, but the, so there's that coming along. But legal, no, it would really more be if national win the election either you know late next year or maybe three years after that they, they have said they would change the tax ration regime for investors back to where it was so that could become a matter of moment next year depending on what the polls are going to show but yeah sorry outside of that of course who knows what's happened on the legal side uh, the labor government didn't tell anybody that they were looking at uh, applying the gst on the you know, kiwi saver fees for for instance so uh, i don't think they're necessarily going to be bringing forward any more surprises in the near future Yep, trying to play it safe as we go into an election. We're, we're running out of time, but still have lots of questions. How, are you up for a quick fire round where I just fire some questions yeah. at you and you give a little one sentence answer? We'll go bang, bang. Okay, cool. Yep. So, Loza. Loza asks, do you anticipate banks allowing first home buyers to have a 10% deposit again? I expect the Reserve Bank will ease the LVRs by the end of this year once house prices are down 15%. It's up to the Reserve Bank rules, not the banks. I expect an easing late this year. Okay, what will the supply of residential property be like over the next two years? Um, the supply will be good in terms of new houses coming onto the market, but watch for the listings, the number of stocks after rising the next few months, I expect them to be falling again through 2023, 24. What do you expect will happen to commercial property over the next 24 months? I think well supported, even though there are challenges for our, our economy, um, businesses need to boost productivity. They'll be looking for more efficient, better located premises. So that's good for construction. There's still plenty of investors looking for exposure to commercial property. There's no upward trend in commercial property demand at the moment, but I see it as something very solid that a lot of people want to have in their portfolio. So I, I don't have any sort of particularly negative view there. Ellie Jones asks, is this housing price cycle going faster than you would normally expect a cycle to go? I'm being generous using the word cycle because none of us expected a pandemic and what would happen. Not a single sane soul thought, oh, global pandemic, house prices will rise 44%. It's, it's just stupid. So um, I've said cycle re repeatedly. That's more me and the way I'm looking at the psychology of the buyers and the sellers out there. Um, I think it's sort of thrown a bit asunder thoughts we might have had for 10 or 20 years about, oh, it's a seven year or a 10 year cycle. Uh, everything's a mess out, out there because of the pandemic. Be careful on some cyclical analysis. Uh, someone asks, what are your thoughts on NZ leading a central bank rate increases globally? What are the pros and cons? Should we have done that? Or should we have held back? Uh, the Reserve Bank uh, uh, doesn't necessarily think what other central banks are doing when they set their policy. They they set it dependent upon New Zealand conditions. And it, uh, much as people like me have stuck the boot into the Reserve Bank the past uh, 12 to 15 months, um, they, they did start moving relatively early. Uh, they're going to get the job done of restraining level of interest rates sooner than other central banks. So 
our central bank really good 2020 i think quite good this year 2021 and not so good for our for our central bank if our interest rates rise faster than overseas you can get the exchange rate going up strongly that's not a fundamental this time around as it's been in previous cycles because the other central banks are sticking the boot in as as well all right and then one last question which is probably a good one to finish on if there's any single takeaway or, or summary from today's webinar what would it be I would like it to be uh, people realizing that we are approaching the bottom of this house price cycle, but house prices will still decline further. This is the point at which it's the uh, best market for a buyer. The vendors are capitulating. Your ability to negotiate is strong and that the buyers who were in the market 12 to 18 months ago, they're still there. They haven't deserted it. They've still got jobs. They've got a better job. They've got better incomes and they are going to step forward at some point. So what I want people to do is recognize for the next few months, we will wallow in talk about brain drain, oversupply, high level of interest rates. But the seeds have already been sown for things turning back up again over 2023. So you might have missed out many times in the past 10 or 15 years. Watch out. You don't miss out this time around as well. Things are changing. Tony, thank you. Amazing, amazing insights. Really appreciate it. Okay, look, thanks, Dan. Thanks, everybody. And if you want more information, I'm writing every week. Go to tonyalexander.nz and you can sign up for my free weekly there if you want. Go for it. All the best, everybody. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Um, next week on Shared Lunch, we're going to be chatting with the CEO slash chair of New Zealand Wind Farms, a renewable energy generator that's pretty popular on the on the old Sharesies platform. Um, a link to register for that discussion is in the chat right now. But until next time, please enjoy your week and stay safe. See you then.